Okay, well, good morning, everybody. <clears throat> All right, if you would like to open the, in your Bibles, Matthew 11. In Matthew 11, 28, of course, most of you probably know this is one of my favorite verses. Matthew 11, 28. <clears throat> you know, when I was searching, looking, trying to find my way in life and start reading the Bible, it was this passage right here that really hit me. You know, fortunately, as I've mentioned, I opened in the New Testament when I started reading the Bible instead of in Genesis. And uh, you didn't have to read very far. I realized, listening to Jesus, that, uh, you know, he was offering some real practical instruction. I didn't know what was in the Bible. I had no idea. And, uh, you know, so I'm reading along, and lo and behold... Come into Matthew chapter 11 and verse uh, 28. Jesus said, Come to me, you who labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, learn from me. I'm gentle and lowly at heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Well, those were very inviting words to me because fundamentally my problem was I had no rest for my soul. I had no peace. I felt that I had torment. My life was troubled. And it was my own doing. I made decisions. I did what was right in my own eyes. I was sowing the wind and reaping the whirlwind. You know, it seemed right to me at the time. There was a way that seems right to a man, but the end of the ways of death. So, I'm reading this book, and Jesus teaching, and he said, well, come to me, you that are laboring and heavy laden. Come to me, I'll, I'll give you rest. Now, you got to do a little something. You got to take his yoke upon you. He had burdens. He said, yeah, but my yoke is easy. My burden is light. He said, come on. You'll find rest for your souls. You know, that's appealing to people. I was having a great study this morning online with uh, Chad and Bethany. Uh, they're in the military over there in Okinawa. I get with them every other week. And I, I, they were asking me about some things. You know, they're getting ready to, they're fellowshipping with a, a different assembly over there in Okinawa. And, you know... Uh, and they got an opportunity made with this Japanese lady and, you know, and was asking me where, you know, what's the best way to try to, you know, really reach her at this time. I said, you know, there are administrative, the basic fundamental doctrines that we can teach about the church to people. You know, you know ultimately you're going to have to teach them about, you know, the plan of salvation, of course, you know, the immersion mission of sins, gift of the Holy Spirit. Remember what Jesus said, teach them, go into all the world, teach them, then baptize them, but then teach them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. Do you need to do that? Teach them to observe all the things that I've commanded. There's things for them to know. But there's a lot of administrative stuff. I'm not going to spend the time in sharing with them until... I open their understanding core of the scriptures. This is about a relationship with God. Granted, one day they're going to need to know how that Jesus is a, the high priest according to Melchizedek. Yeah, you're going to need to do that. You're going to need to go, have to show them about the qualification of elders and deacons. You're going to need to do that. And about various... Uh, other things, you know, of course, the observance of the Lord's Supper would, would be one of the ones you'd want to get to pretty soon because they're not going to be a Christian very long before they should be around the Lord's table like about every other or about every seven days, right? Kind of comes around, keeps coming around. Yeah. It's not circumcision, Paul said, or uncircumcision that avails anything, but faith working through love. To love God with all your heart, your soul, your strength, to 
to love your neighbor as yourself is the fir first and second great commandment. Got to get them in that relationship. They want that relationship, whether they know it or not. If they're troubled, and they are, how do I know? Anyone outside of Christ is troubled. You can paste a silly smile on your face, and you can go around laughing all the time. But if you're outside of Christ, you are not a happy camper. It's, it's impossible, according to the Scripture. And let's talk about why. They're unregenerated outside of Christ. They're a natural man. A natural man. <clears throat> Remember what Jeremiah 17 and 9 tells us about the man's heart? The natural man's heart? The heart, verse 9, is, deceit, is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I didn't give you this one, might as well. Right in the very beginning, right before the flood, what did God see about the heart of the man? Then the Lord saw, Genesis 6 and 5, that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continuously. So what he did, Noah, build me an ark. He drowned all these wretched people. <clears throat> then it said that Noah's descendants repopulated the earth. Well, then you, got, you fast forward thousands of years here to Jeremiah, who's telling us the heart is deceitful above all things. Drowned and all them people didn't fix that. The man's still the same. The man is still the same. What does Paul say to the Christian in Ephesians chapter 2. Now we're talking, C, B, C. I mean, like, there was a B, C. There's still a B, C. For individuals, there was a B, C for the whole world before Christ, before he came. Well, 2,000 years ago he came in the fullness of time. But every individual coming up in every generation will have a B, C before Christ is in their lives or before they're in Christ. So Paul would write to the Ephesian people in uh, Ephesians 2 and 1, He made you alive, Paul said, who were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, speaking of the devil, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, we're by nature or naturally children of wrath just as others. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we was dead in trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. And by his, this grace, we have been saved. Look at that man's condition. Walking according to the course of this world. Following the devil. Uh, giving themselves over constantly, consistently, and lost to the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. I didn't write this one down. I'll give it to you anyway. But right there in Colossians 1 and then 21, and you who were once alienated and enemies in your mind by what wicked works, yet he now has reconciled. In your mind. That's where all the darkness reside. That's the unregenerated man. That's not 10% of the human race. That's all of the human race. Ephesians 4. Specifically then, now he can speak specifically to people who have been born again, but then he still warns, he still admonishes us in Ephesians 4 and 17. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord. After we you know, just read the, you know, the second chapter, that we've all been there and done that. We have all walked according co to the course of this world. He said, yeah, but not no more. Not no more. Ephesians 4 and 17, this, I say therefore testify in the Lord, you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of the mind. 
having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that's in them, because of the blindness of the heart, having been past feeling, giving themselves over to lewdness, to work on cleanness with greediness. But no, you've not so learned Christ like this. If indeed you've heard him, and if you've been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. Here's what he expects now. You put off now concerning that former conduct, that old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful us, be renewed in your mind where you was an enemy before and alienated from the life of God. Now be renewed there in the spirit of your mind and that you put on the new man which is created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Every individual has not begun in that process now, we might say, you know, we, we talk about sometimes, you know, we make reference. I know I say it. You know, pretty good people. There's a good person. You know, matter, matter, you know we sometimes characterize people, some that we know, as pretty good people. Yeah, not everybody's a commode hugger, you know what I mean? Not everybody's walking around, you know, with a swastika tattooed in their forehead with a green mohawk and blood in their eyes. You know what I mean? <laughs> Not everybody is totally stone crazy out there. There's a few. But I'm telling you what, you cannot manufacture peace in your own heart or joy and peace in believing, even though that's what everybody wants. I really believe this. I believe all Al Capone wanted was, you know, he wanted to feel good. He wanted to have money. He just got it at the end of a Tommy gun. Bup, 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 bup. You know what I mean? That's what people want. I don't, you know, when I read about, what's his name, Pablo Escobar, man, one of them, one of them, one of them mid drug cartel guys down there in one of El Salvador or somewhere down in Central America, man. I mean, he constantly slept with a gun under his pillow. He was a killer, man. But, you know, if you got all that money, but you're look, jumping at every, looking behind every tree and every shadow, what kind of life is that? <clears throat> all that money? But you can't go out in the daylight. You can't go out without a bunch of bodyguards around you because everybody wants to kill you. That's crazy. But again, my point is, there's a lot of people out there. They're not like that, but they ain't happy. They're empty. There's a deficit in every human heart. If you don't know God, it's an emptiness. And I think sometimes it's that uneasy feeling that people feel like something's going to happen. And they don't know what it is. And it's like an itch you can't scratch, you know. It just, you're constantly trying to find comfort. You can't get there. <clears throat> because that emptiness is the separation from God. See, they may not realize that that happens to everybody. Children being blameless and innocent, having no knowledge of good and evil... Kids can be, you know, pretty happy running around. They don't think about serious things because they have no knowledge of good or evil. But when the commandment comes, sin revives, and boom, they die. I think I told you that maybe, I was, maybe it was even last week. I can't remember. You know, back in my day, I was in my 20s driving down the road, one hand over one eye so I didn't see two roads. Easy. And I had a feeling that, man, there was darkness all around me. It was nighttime, but that ain't the darkness I was feeling. I remember thinking it was darkness. And I didn't even know that was a biblical concept. I know it now. So, see, it is biblical. Whether you know it or not, whether they know it or not, all them people out there, and I don't care who they are, whether they're Americans, Asians, Africans, Russians, it doesn't matter if they're human. They ain't going to escape the process. Paul makes it clear. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Wages of sin is death. That separation, that emptiness. He said, the mind is futile. The mind is where we are enemies of God in our minds. Our understanding is darkened, alienated from the life of God because of ignorance and blindness of heart. What kind of quality of life is that? That's Gentile quality of life, he said. Gentile. 
What's a Gentile? Well, let's just say for our purposes, first of all, it would be a non-Jew, but it's anyone outside of Christ. And a Jew is outside of Christ, by the way. Everybody's all happy about the good things happening in Jerusalem. I am too. I'm glad we opened up our embassy in Jerusalem. I really, you know, that's great. That's fine. But I'll tell you what, those Jews do not accept that Jesus of Nazareth is the Messiah, Son of God. And let me tell you what Jesus had to say about that. If they do not believe that he is he, the Son of the living God, they will die in their sins. And where he is going, he said, where I'm going, you ain't coming. It's still true today. You know how I see Jewish people? They're human beings. And Paul says in Romans 11, if they don't stay in that unbelief that they're in, he said they can be grafted in again. So the solution for them is don't be staying in that unbelief. They can be grafted in. So all people who transition across that line of having no knowledge of good and evil to knowing good and evil are going to slide into the darkness. And then all that futility of mind, darkened understanding, ignorance, blindness of heart, which will then give you over to lewdness, to work all uncleanness with greediness. And there ain't no quality of life in that. So Jesus said, learn from me then. Come to me. Are you in that condition? He said, come to me. Come to me, learn from me, and you will find rest for your souls. You know, Titus, we'll read that, and it makes it clear. We've all clearly been there and done that. If you just grab Titus real quick, Titus 3. We were once foolish, he said. Verse 3. Titus 3 and 3. We ourselves were also, we was once foolish, disobedient deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice, envy, hateful, hating one another. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we've done, but according to his mercy, he saves us through the washing of regeneration, there's your baptism, and the renewing of the Holy Spirit whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. That indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit will bring about the transformation. Talking about the new birth. You know, we can't boast, you know. It's not by works of righteousness that we've done. You know, God has, it seems in so many ways, so little from us. He does all the heavy lifting. He did all of this. All this is the works of his hands. All of this is all according to the eternal purpose, which he purposed in Christ Jesus before the world even began and chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we would be holy and without blame before him in love. Adopted his children in the household of God himself. Redeems us. We're accepted in the beloved. That's all his action, Jackson. So little, it seems, he expects from us. Except to love him. To seek his face. To feel after him. Find him. I mean, I just admit it. I had my chance to take my life and do what I wanted to do. Well, you know how that turned out. You know, and I imagine all of you could say the exact same thing. Otherwise, you wouldn't be sitting in here if you had it all figured out and was going great. But don't cut ourselves short. Sometimes people, they go through the born-again process, but they don't ever grow, and so they still find themselves having this, uh, this nervousness, this apprehension, this worrying and fretting and, and all that same old stresses. See, stresses come from a confused mind, fear of unknowns. We start to dread and worry. And of course, when we're like that, then we start grabbing at controls, man. We feel like we got to start driving again. And God's trying to peel our fingers off the steering wheel of our lives. 
We're supposed to trust in him. We're supposed to seek his face. Leaning not on our own understanding. Jesus said, you come and learn from me. You've got to be taught by me. Isaiah 26, even in the Old Testament, says, Thou will keep him, verse 3, I believe, Isaiah 26 and 3, You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he what? Trust in you. Trust in you. Thou will keep him in perfect peace. Do you like that idea, perfect peace? You know, that proverb in Proverbs 3 and 5, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. Now in all your ways acknowledge him, and he'll direct your paths. Don't be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord. Depart from evil. It'll be health to your flesh and strength to your bones. God can keep you in perfect peace if your mind is stayed on him because you're trusting in him. He knows what he's doing. He ain't going to drop us on our head now. When Jesus said, learn from me, look at this book. Look at this book. How thick this book. You know, like I said before, some people, <clears throat> their understanding of Scripture, and they think what this is all about, you could fit on a 3 by 5 card. Well, all this stuff right here is a heck of a lot more than it would fit on a 3 by 5 card. What do you suppose all this is for? That's why faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God. Man doesn't live, Jesus said, by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Why? It, it builds the faith. The transformation, renewing of the mind is going to come when we begin to build that superstructure of faith empowered by the Holy Spirit to bring about the practicing righteousness that gives us the peace that passes understanding. It's a joint effort. The faith part's our part. You see that when you study scripture. Jesus would say, well, according to your faith be done to you. They wanted something from him. They wanted healing. We all want healing. I'm not talking about a physical healing, a healing of the soul. The healing of the soul. You got the faith for it? He got the power for it. That's why you have all those great miracles, man. Eyes opening, the deaf could hear, the lame could walk, the lepers were cleansed, the demons was cast out of people, dead was raised. People are like, yeah. But you also saw what happened a lot of times. Then people got the physical healing they wanted. They had it for the hills. You know what I mean? The 10 lepers in Luke 17. You know that story. Heals 10. They take off. One turns around to give thanks. Jesus said, well, they're not 10 cleansed. Where did them other guys go? Oh, I know they went to the church building. Sure they did. Went right to the casino, man. They went to the club. We don't need the hassle. What at? <laughs> we need the healing, all right. And it's the healing of the soul. He will keep us in perfect peace if we, whose mind stays on him. What does Paul say? It's New, new, uh, new Testament. You know, that's the thing. You see the Old Testament, New Testament, all saying the same thing. But the, the fullness of time, man, is what it's all about. And these are those times. We have access to all this stuff. Well, keep him in perfect peace. His mind is stayed on thee because you trust in him. Well, if you was raised with Christ, Paul said, we just shot forward. I mean, Isaiah was written in what, 739 B.C.? It was even before the destruction of Jerusalem the first time by the Babylonians. 739. Now that you got the apostle Paul saying the same thing, well, if you was raised with Christ, if you was born again, well, seek those things which are above, he says in Colossians 3 and 1. Where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Now set your mind on things above, not on things that are earth. Why? Because you died. And your life is hidden with Christ in God. You died. Hmm. You know, that's so hard for us. I, I get that. I, I've been through all this. I have nothing different me than anybody else. We have to grow in this stuff because we have to start under, listening to what he's telling us. How, I mean, none of us ever died before. How are we supposed to know what that's like? And we've been to funerals before. We see what dead people 
do, or should say don't do, they don't do nothing. He said, well, you're dead. That kind of tells you how much involvement I still got in this world, yet I'm here. Paul said, well, I'm crucified with Christ, yet I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live in my flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That we can actually be here, be living here, as Jesus said in John 17, praying to his Father, Father, I'm not asking you to take them out of the world. Because I'm sending them into the world. Like you sent me, I'm sending them. But I pray that you'll keep them from the evil one. In it, but not of it, he said. They're in it, but they're not going to be of the world. A little hard for us sometimes to wrap that around our heads. Or get our heads wrapped around it, I guess I should say. But you know, he wouldn't be telling us things like that if we weren't made for this. If we weren't capable of it. But we do have to apply ourselves. We do have to apply ourselves. We can know these things. And then we can live them. And you will reap the benefit just as he says we will. You know, he said right there, uh, I guess I turned this too soon. You could have stayed in Isaiah 55 for just a second kind of going along with what I'm saying right now about the idea. This is hard for us. What's God say? Verse 8, my thoughts aren't your thoughts. <clears throat> That's for sure. Nor are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. That's for sure. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts and your thoughts. That would have been a true statement then, back then when that was written. And it's true for everybody that's still outside of Christ. Their thoughts ain't his thoughts. Their ways aren't his ways. Of course not. We've already established that. The unregenerated man, the natural man, cannot receive these things. Go right there to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. We've looked at this before. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. It tells us, verse 14, the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. Why? It's foolishness to them. Nor can they know them. Why? Because these things of God have to be spiritually discerned by comparing spiritual with spiritual. Verse 13 tells you that. An unregenerated person can't do that. And we've looked at before, if you go right there in the beginning of chapter 2, Paul said, when I came to you, I wasn't going to come and bamboozle you with worldly wisdom. And he said, I was with you in fear and trembling. We've said before, well, what was he scared of? Well, he wasn't scared of them. And he was in awe. He was stunned. He was blown away. He was like Daniel. When Daniel saw the visions, man, he said his strength went right out of him because it blew his mind. You know what I'm saying? He didn't know what to say. He was, he was sick. He said, I couldn't eat for three weeks. The visions just blew his mind. When Jesus said, I said this last week when I was talking about, you know, the, the expanding of the mind, you know, that Jesus said, you have, I have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear it now. But when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. What he meant was you don't have the capacity to, to take in what i got to give you. But now we see Paul speaking, he said in wisdom, verse 7, we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom of God, ordained before the ages for our glory. This is the wisdom was not revealed to the sons of men in times past, Paul said, which is now revealed by the spirit to the holy apostles and prophets, see, mentions that in Ephesians 3, which none of the rulers of this age knew, verse 8, he or says there, had they known it, they wouldn't have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it's written, the eye hasn't seen it, nor, nor heard it, nor even entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God has, it says, revealed them to us through his Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things. Yes, the deep things of God. Jesus said, you come and learn from me. you find rest for your soul. When we don't have this outside information, this revelation to unscramble all this chaos in our brains, see, it takes divine assistance to get our thinking straight. Think about it. I don't know when you got baptized or when you began the journey, 
But I know for me, it was about 30 years old. That's a whole lot of life to think wrong things and then suddenly get out of the tank. Got to start thinking right thoughts. When God said, your thoughts ain't been my thoughts and your ways ain't been my ways, that is a true statement. Well, you ain't changing your mind in five minutes. You're going to fight with that old mindset. But, you know, I think I shared before, if you look in Matthew chapter 10, I like this. You got a great example. First, he has compassion on the multitudes coming out of that ninth chapter. They're scattered and wearied like sheep without a shepherd there in verse 36 there out of Matthew 9. 37, it says, To the disciples, the harvest truly is plentiful, the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of harvest to send laborers in the harvest. And the very next thing you see is he's sending them. So be careful what you pray for. He said, look, I'm going to send you out here. Now, don't go in the way of the Gentiles, he says in verse 5. Don't enter any of the Samaritan cities, but rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Verse 7 says, now as you go, preach. Tell them the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to heal sick, cleanse lovers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Freely as you receive, freely give. Don't be worrying about taking gold and silver, or copper in your money bags and all this, or two tunics or sandals or staff, the workers worthy. Okay. Verse 11. Now, whatever city or town you enter, inquire in it who's worthy. Stay there till you go out. And when you go into a household, greet it. If the household is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it's not worthy, let your peace return to you. And whoever will not receive you nor hear your words when you depart from that house or that city, shake the dust off your feet. Assuredly, I say to you, be more tolerable in the land of Sodom and Gomorrah than the, in Judgment Day than for that city. Now, I used to read that, and I couldn't figure out what is going to happen to this house when I go in there. I mean, I'm looking for something to happen to the house, you know, the, the peace come on the house. And then when, they, when I go, it either is going with me or, you know, it's like, how does that work? Well, I'll tell you what. Then I experienced it. Then I knew it makes sense. I've gone into a household before knowing there was trouble in there. I knew from somebody else they were having a tough time. But they were expecting us for Bible study. So we show up. Lady is real, f hi, come on in. All friendly, acting. But her eyes weren't shining too bright. I saw pain in her eyeballs. You know, the eyes, the Bible said, Jesus said, like the windows to the soul. See, you could see there's trouble in there. You got a smile on their face. Come on in. There was problems. Trouble. Stress. Anxiety. Fear. Depression. So sit down. We're going to have a Bible study. But as we're rolling along and bringing out good things, powerful things, positive things, things, hope things, truth things, tying them all together, painting big pictures, and I'm watching the countenance change. Now, it's not like this is the first Bible study with this person, okay, so, the, you know, they got a little background, but sometimes, you know, we're like James says, we look in the mirror, we behold our, yeah, I see it, and we walk away from the mirror, and then we forget what we look like. Sometimes when people see it momentarily, and they go, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. And pretty soon then with time, and, you, you know, we're still in the world, and you got to go to work, and you got this, that, and every other thing. Pretty soon they forget, they forget everything. And they're back where they started from. So any watching, watching the countenance change. Watch the eyes starting to get bright. And even have them say, you know, I was really having a bad day today, but, man, I'm glad you came over. This has really been good. And it's like, okay, you know, as you're going out the door and they're standing on the porch waving. and I've seen that. But I've also, now that's probably my phone or my thing. Is that horn beeping out there? <laughs> oh, did it? Two toots for ten after. Okay. Oh, is that how that, okay. And when they lay on it, it's, it's like, Shut up. 
But I've been in the house where somebody's sitting there like this, you know, where I've been invited to come do, and boy, I'm telling you what. I said, well, we could turn here. Let's look at this. And they're like, and pretty soon, they weren't happy when I got there. They were even more unhappy when I left. And I mean, I am shaking the dust off my feet and getting out of there. Uh, so you can experience that. See, what happens? Come and learn from me. See, if you've heard Jesus, you've been taught by Jesus. What happens, for lack of a better way to describe it, I think of our mind sometimes and our stress and our depression and it's all knotted up and we, we're fretting about everything. And I believe that the power of the word of God and the powerful images he puts before us, when truth all comes together, opens up like a linear path. All of a sudden, all that confusion starts to straighten out, and we can actually see. We see the goal. We see it's attainable. It's re and uh, we can reach that. We can attain to that. What did Brian say in the stewardship? How did you word that about uh, the people that can overcome it? They see it, and they believe it. And how do you say they do that? Um, well, it's good. <laughs> Whatever the quote was, yeah. that I can do this and then do it. Okay? That's what God does. He, he puts it into perspective where we see, I can do this. You know, if you start something, a new job or something the first time, and people are telling you, you, got it, you know, you're like, oh, man, overwhelming, don't understand it. You know, and you're freaking out. You know, the boss has got an expectation for you to produce something, and he wants it by noon, and you're the new guy, and you're like, and someone else comes by and says, look, all he wants you to do is, you know, this, this, and put that there, and do, 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 do. And you go, that's it? That's it. Well, I can do that. And here you were already all stressed out for a minute, and all of a sudden when somebody said, no, this is all he's telling you what you got to do here. You go, well, I can do that. And all of a sudden the stress goes down. What happened? Nothing. It, your thoughts, your mind saw. It saw the possibilities. And you realized, yes, I can. Joshua and Caleb, we're well able to do this. And the other said, no, we're not. No, we're not. And we ain't going. We're getting us a captain. We're going back to Egypt. And you don't shut up. We'll stone you. How in the world could these 12 people go look at the same thing and have totally opposite uh, opinions about the possibilities? One had eyes to see or two had eyes to see. The others didn't. To be spiritually minded, the scripture tells us in Romans 8 and 6, is life and peace. Spiritual mindedness. God has revealed to us things that the, the ear had never heard before, the eye had never seen before, never even entered into the heart of man before. But now he has revealed it to us by his spirit. Jesus said, with God all things are possible. And when you're studying through the scripture, you see that's a fact. With God all things are possible for each and every one of us. He can sort out our minds. And we'll feel strong. We'll feel, as Paul said, that peace that passes understanding. Look at what he tells you here as we kind of wind it down here before my horn starts beeping again. Uh, in Philippians, same thing. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 4, Rejoice in the Lord always again. I say, rejoice. Is that your habit of being? Do you feel that on a regular basis, rejoicing? We should. We should. Are there tough days? Yeah, but that shouldn't be destroying us or overthrowing our faith. Let your gentleness be known to all men, the Lord's at hand. Be anxious for nothing. Don't be anxious. But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. Peter says, cast all your care upon him, for he cares about you. Where's kids? Where's children? And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ. Man, that's our, our, he's our rock, our fortress, our deliverer, our tower, our shield. Our buckler, all those things the way David described him. And he was surrounded by real enemies, real ugly guys with swords and battle axes that wanted to kill him. Yet he trusted 
in the Lord. Finally, brethren, Paul said, well, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are good report, anything, any virtue or anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things, the things which you have learned and received and heard and saw in me. These do. And what? The God of peace be with you. God of peace will be with you. That's obviously someone who has his mind set on things above. These are individuals who are kept in perfect peace. Why? Because their mind is set on God. And they trust him. You know, we are responsible for our thoughts. You, can't, you, you sometimes can't help what happens to you on a daily basis, you know, events, circumstances that occur, but you are 100, we are all 100% responsible for our response to those things. And our response to our circumstances and things that happen will be determined by our mindset. Where is the mind at? If the mind is set to the flesh, and something like that happens, no doubt about it, you're going to respond in a carnal, fleshly way. If the mind is set to the Spirit, on the things of the Spirit, walking in the Spirit and strengthening and, and, and pulling from the Scripture, look, you can't just do that when the stuff happens. It needs to be there before that stuff happens. Because if stuff happens, I mean, it can happen in an instant. It could be a phone call. It could be crossing a, a road. Stuff happens, right, Joe? <laughs> I know Dan ain't here and live. Stuff happens, broad daylight. Boom. If you got to start looking for your faith when that stuff happens, you're going to have a bad time with it. The time of having that kind of faith that can take whatever life has got to throw at you, the time is now. In the green tree, we got to be putting all that stuff in place. But it sounds so simple. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true and noble, uh, pure, lovely, good report, virtuous, praiseworthy, we'll think on these things. The God of peace will be with you. It is mindset. And this is what it's all about. This is what Jesus meant when he said, come and learn from me. And you will find rest for your souls. And that's what we are to have, and this is what we're supposed to be able to take out from here to the folks out there that don't have, their, have that yet. And they shall. Thank you for your attention this morning.